In the previous chapter, we learned that members of irregular armed forces may lose their status of combatant and therefore their right to protection as prisoners of war. If they do not respect certain conditions, the most important being that they distinguish themselves from the civilian population. Members of irregular armed forces who fail to distinguish themselves from civilians are often qualified as unlawful combatants, although we know that such a category is not a legal one under IHL. As you also already know, the conditions that armed forces must abide by in order to maintain their combatant status evolved between the Third Geneva Convention and Additional Protocol 1. Under the Third Geneva Convention, there are four conditions that must be upheld, including wearing a fixed distinctive sign. Those conditions were softened by Additional Protocol 1 in order to take into account specific armed conflicts, such as guerrilla movements. Such groups no longer have to distinguish themselves from civilian population at all times. So the crucial question is whether combatants that do not respect such conditions of distinction, either under the Third Geneva Convention or Additional Protocol 1, for example, because they do no longer wear a fixed distinctive sign, whether they should be considered as civilians protected against attacks unless they directly participate in hostilities? Or do they still belong to state armed forces and can be targeted at any time? The answer seems to be clear with respect to Additional Protocol 1. Article 44 provides the condition of distinction necessary to obtain combatant and prisoners of war status. It is distinct from Article 43, which defines the notion of state armed forces for the purposes of targeting. Thus, the requirements to be entitled to combatant and prisoner of war status are more onerous than those required to be qualified as state armed forces. In brief, members of state armed forces who do not distinguish themselves from the civilian population in violation of Article 44 must still be considered as members of state armed forces and remain targetable as long as they are members of those forces. Nevertheless, they will lose their combatant status and if captured, they will not be entitled to be treated as a prisoner of war. However, the third Geneva Convention is less clear on that, on that respect. Contrary to Additional Protocol 1, it does not contain any specific provision that defines state armed forces. Article 4A2 mentions some conditions relevant for defining irregular state armed forces. However, the provision is unclear as to whether those conditions are relevant or not for the law of targeting. One view prompted by the RCRC is that they are not relevant for the law of targeting, but only with respect to the entitlement of the prisoners of war status, since the Third Geneva Convention is entirely devoted to regulating that. For those states that are not party to Additional Protocol 1, it is then argued that Article 43 of that protocol, which defines the notion of state armed forces, for the purpose of the law of targeting, without referring to any condition of distinction, has acquired a customary status and is therefore applicable to them. In the RCRC opinion, such a view avoids leading to the paradoxical situation where unlawful combatant under the Third Geneva Convention would be considered as civilians and therefore enjoy a better protection from attacks than those who fulfill the required conditions. However, 
That view has been criticized as not being entirely coherent. As we saw in chapter 4, there are strong arguments for granting a lawful combatant who do not respect the conditions under the Third Geneva Convention the protection afforded to civilians by the Fourth Geneva Convention, provided that the conditions for such protection are fulfilled. So those unlawful combatants should be considered as members of state armed forces for the purpose of the law of targeting, but as protected as civilians, especially when they are detained for the purpose of the application of the force Geneva Convention. While this dual status has been criticized, others have argued that there is nothing inherently problematic in employing different qualifications for different purposes. Moreover, such a twofold qualification does not arise with respect to unlawful combatants under Additional Protocol 1, since, according to the protocol, as you know from Chapter 4, such unlawful combatants must be given a protection equivalent to that of prisoners of war and not as protected civilians.